listeners, my name is Katherine Naperska, and welcome to my section of the Teen Podcast. Language arts teachers love novel studies. They help you better understand the story, and they make you dive deeper into what the author of a particular book is trying to convey. I distinctly remember having one teacher that was very adamant about not using graphic novels to study during novel studies. And I thought at first it was because it was short, and people would be able to finish them quickly say, quicker than the people who are reading only text-filled novels. Now I'm wondering, why aren't they allowed? Besides the length, there are really good stories told through graphic novels, and surely that's what you're being graded on, is your story comprehension. Novels come in different lengths, so length isn't really an issue. I set out to interview language arts teachers at my school to find out their opinions. Surprisingly, the majority said they were okay with students using graphic novels during their novel studies, For the sake of privacy and confidentiality, I won't be using any teacher's names or mentioning what school I go to. So as I mentioned earlier, the majority of teachers I interviewed were actually okay with graphic novels being used as novel study choices. The answers as to why I found were quite varied. First of all, our ideas of what real literature are have changed, and there are many different ways of consuming content. I like that expression, consuming content, and different ways to send a message through story. Assessment during novel studies is based on whether or not they understand what they've read, and whether or not they can think critically about what they've read. Also, there are many different challenges students face when it comes to either people with ADD or ADHD having shorter attention spans, or maybe people whose English isn't their first language, so something like Jane Austen would be a little more difficult to understand. Secondly, art is such a powerful means of presenting emotion and story in a way that text sometimes can't. For example, you can draw a pretty sparkling elven forest without pages upon pages of description. Yes, J.R.R. Tolkien, I'm looking at you. Anyway, it's also important that students are exposed to various forms of literature, because novels aren't the only way to tell a longer story. Both these previous teachers also mentioned a graphic novel called Persepolis about the Iranian Revolution. Art can also help present important and heavy topics in a way that's more digestible. I haven't read it yet but I feel like I might in high school. Thirdly, and I love this reason, is it can help foster the love for reading in a student. Many people that say they don't like reading say it's because it's long and boring, but it doesn't have to be. If the graphic novel is suitable for the reading level of the student and has great subtleties and plot devices, why not use it as a novel study subject? They're great for learning about different plot devices and reading strategies. This kind of goes with what was said earlier, but it can help students strengthen their vocabulary, build their reading confidence, and generate inquiry, so basically making questions about that text. Building reading confidence is such a great thing too, and imagine the satisfaction of actually understanding what you were reading for the first time. Who cares if there are pictures, if you finally understand the story and connect with characters? That's what matters. And the final reason in our pros list, reading is supposed to be a pleasant experience. If you have to struggle through a 50k word fantasy novel or dystopia, sci-fi, or whatever, and you're hating every second of it, ouch. If there's a reading medium you enjoy, why not use it? After all, language is always evolving. Reading and writing is no different. And now for our cons list. I really like this metaphor one teacher used. In volleyball, the coach made them do a lot of sit-ups. Sit-ups suck the more you do them, but they help work your muscles And for volleyball, you need a really strong core. So the same goes for reading. The more words there are, the more your brain has to work to visualize and make the images in your head. And sometimes visualizing what everything looks like in a novel is half the fun. Also, if you're studying the style of writing and the quality of work for a novel, you'd be studying the author, but for a graphic novel, it's more likely to be the illustrator. However, there are some good graphic novels out there. The teacher that I was talking to here mentioned Le Nouveau, a graphic novel about African heritage and bullying in schools. It just didn't have its place in a novel study for him. And it's true. Graphic novels can be great forms of storytelling, but it makes the student lose the ability to imagine or visualize in their brain what the setting looks like or what the characters look like. So we have a lot of varying opinions here. Personally, I'm on the pro side, but I understand the cons now a lot more than I did when I was 10. So I mentioned Le Nouveau and Persepolis, And to finish this segment, I'll be talking about some of my favorite graphic novel recommendations. First off, any graphic novel by Raina Telgemeier. She's written Smiles, Sisters, Drama, Ghosts, Guts, and I think she also illustrated the Babysitter's Club graphic novels for some time. Smile, Sisters, 
and Guts are based off of her own life, and the Babysitter's Club graphic novels are based off of Anna Martin's iconic novel series. Second on my list is El Defo, a graphic novel illustrated by C.C. Bell, and is an account of her childhood being deaf. All the characters in it are bunnies, and I think it's great to present her childhood struggles being deaf through this medium. It was an amazing read, really opened my eyes to a perspective I'd never seen before, in a cute, digestible, yet serious and legitimate way. Finally, the Anne of Green Gables graphic novel, based off of Lucy Maud Montgomery's classic, and illustrated by Man Mariah Marsden and Brenna Thumler. This is an amazing choice for those who might want to experience this Canadian classic, but struggle with the old language used in the original. And that brings us to the end of this podcast segment. Which side are you on? Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye! Hey guys, this is Kian from the Team Podcast. I hope you're doing great and having a fantastic day while listening to me. In today's podcast, I'll be talking about the two best films that I've watched lately and briefly explain to you why I like them and encourage you, no, let's put it in this way, force you to watch these two films in regards to have a better realization of yourself and your true human nature and I know you may say that who the heck am I to say this stuff but believe it or not some of the films that I've recently watched had a huge impact on me and kind of opened my eyes to some hidden aspects of life. I know that's a little bit cliche and dramatic but believe it or not these films were fabulous. I mean just fabulous and I'm glad that I watched them and I hope that I can explain to you in a way to not spoil it and also force you to go on your laptops and say, okay, now I know why he said these films are really good. First and foremost, The Path of Glory, directed by one of the gods that I truly worship, ladies and gents, Stanley Kubrick. I don't know where to start, but the film, or better say, masterpiece that I watched a few weeks ago, it was just brilliant. So the story setting happens in the World War II period, and it's about France's army's pathetic action to kill two of their own soldiers to make their forces feel the fear to attack Germans without any hesitation i mean it kind of reminds me of a time when i was like seven years old and my father pretended that if you don't eat your vegetables some kind of monster will steal your cartoons and for those of you who don't know my cartoons were like hundreds at a time and were truly like important for me i just love them i I mean, I'm in it. So back to the film and why you should watch it. I would say that the film reveals that the stupidity of human actions and how tough humans deal with the matter of this differently. I mean, just literally anything. This film is really underrated. It is one of the first pieces of Kubrick made in the 50s and it's by far better than any anti-war slash anti-human film that I've seen with great memorable characters, villains, visually stunning. It's a black and white film actually. Realistic dialogues and etc. It's just perfect so please watch it and thank me later for that. In the second place, The Hunt is a film directed by a Danish filmmaker named Thomas Winterberg. It's actually a Danish film too. I've seen a couple of his works before and uh, one day I just randomly searched his name and saw this film. It's his most famous work and I was like, like why not? Like I should watch it. So talking about the plot and setting of this story, it's about the kindergarten teachers word collapses around him after one of his students who has a crush on him 
And I repeat that, a kindergarten teacher. Yeah, that's kind of messed up. Who has a question on him implies that he committed a sexual act in front of her. That's so messed up. Like, since her nice teacher doesn't look like that, and at the same time, everyone around him is getting suspicious of him, and after a while, his whole life gets worse and worse. I'm not giving you any further information in regard to the film and the ending, because you have to watch it and know why I liked it. But in response to why should you watch it, I would say that the message behind the film was people around us sometimes make decisions and do actions which will deeply change us, no matter they're right or wrong. But what is the actual truth? So that was the filmmaker's view of this film and what he wanted to say in this film but as i said before i don't think this is a good idea to spoil the story for you because it ruins the whole story and it's on the list of my favorite films and i think i have watched some of its scenes a couple of times and i was thinking to watch its script and because i usually read my most favorite films as scripts and I think it's a good idea. It's kind of like a book, you know, like reading them. I mean, I suggest someone who uh, would do that often. I don't do it always, but reading the script of the film is not a bad idea, actually. So, as my last words to you, I wanted to say thanks for listening to me. And also, I hope that you enjoyed the time that I briefly shared my feelings toward these two films. And do me a favor, okay? And watch them. Enjoy the beauty of films. Till the next time, have a good one, you dear listener. Bye-bye. Hey guys, it's Bran. And for today's podcast segment, I'll be talking about one of the most famous supergroups, the Traveling Wilburys. The term supergroup is referred to as a group made out of members of other bands and they make music as a new group. The Traveling Wilburys was a supergroup from the 1980s consisting of George Harrison from the Beatles, Roy Orbison, Jeff Lynne from Electric Light Orchestra, Tom Petty from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and Bob Dylan. The supergroup originally started because George needed another song for his 1987 album, Cloud Nine. One night he had dinner with Jeff Lynne and Roy Orbison when he enlisted the help of Jeff to create a song for the album. Roy had asked to join them and watch them work, and they said yes. They knew that Bob had a recording studio, and so they called him and he asked, and he allowed them. That morning, George, Jeff, and Roy all went to Tom Petty's house to pick up the guitar, and he inevitably, inevitably tagged along. When they arrived at home, at the home studio, they found a box that they handled with care, and that's how they got the title. George had written a part for Roy and asked the other th- three to join them in the song, and that's how the group formed. The Traveling Wilburys had two albums, album, er, Volume 1 and Volume 3, the latter of which was not a mishap, but for a comedic reason. Volume 1 included Orbison, but, they sa- but sadly he passed away before the main Volume 3. Some of their hits from Volume 1 were Handle with Care, and of the line and heading for the light and they all reached the top 100 volume 3 include hits like wilbury twist and cheese my baby one thing the traveling wilbury said was instead of using their actual names they created a pseudonym name for themselves the wilbury brothers harrison was nelson lynn was otis orbison was lefty tom or petty was charles t jr and dylan was lucky those names switch over Volume 3 when they change to Spike, Clayton, Muddy, and Boo. I'm going to move on to a little blur about each one, then I will talk about the songs I recommend from each of the members, and then I'll wrap it up and why they mean a lot to me. George Harrison was born on February 25th, 1943, in Liverpool, England. The band that he came from was the Beatles, which in my opinion, he gets looked, on, looked past by 
because J- Paul and John often sang the most of the songs and wrote them too. But in my personal opinion, some of the best Beatles songs were sung and written by George. He passed away on November 9th, 29th, 2001. A song I suggest from him is Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth from his 1973 album, Living in a Material World. Jeffrey Lynn was born on December 30th, 1947 in Birmingham, England. England. The band he came from was ELO, or also, slash also known as Electric Light Orchestra, which had many, many hits. One song that I suggest of his is Telephone Line from ELO's a New World Record album in ni- from 1977. It reached number one in Canada. Roy Orbison was born on April 23rd, 1936 in Vernon, Texas. He passed away on December 6th, 1988. One song that I suggest from Orbison is Oh Pretty Woman from from 1964. It's a well-known, well-known song, and, and it's also very iconic. Tom Petty was born on October 20th, 1950 in Gainesville, Florida. He was the lead singer of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, which was formed in 1976. He passed away on October 2nd, 2017. One song I suggest from him is from his solo is his solo hit "Free Falling." Bob Dylan was born on May twenty fourth, nineteen forty one, in Duluth, Minnesota. He was all, he is often regarded as one of the greatest songwriters. His lyrics earning him a Nobel Prize in Literature. One song I recommend from Bob Dylan's discography is "Subterranean Homesick Blues" from his album "Bringing It All Back Home." One reason why I love this band so much is that it includes three of my most favorite singers, Harrison, Lynn, and Dylan. And personally, I think it's super cool how this group, super group was made. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, see ya! Hey, everybody. My name is Callie Turner, and I'm a volunteer for the Public Library's Teen Talk podcast. So to start off, I love to read books, and I'm very excited to talk to you today about one of my favorite books and its sequel written by Kristen Hanna. If you don't already know who she is, you should definitely look her up because she is one of my favorite authors, and I promise you she will not disappoint. She was actually one of the first authors who made me love reading. I read the first book, Firefly Lane, when I was just getting hooked on reading, and it was so easy to get into and I never got bored, so if you're a beginner reader or an experienced reader, this is a great book all around. Firefly Lane and its sequel, Fly Away, is a story about two friends, Tully and Kate. The two characters came from different backgrounds, but they managed to become best friends. Tully had a dysfunctional upbringing. Her father had passed away, and her mother was a drug addict. Tully was raised by her very strict grandmother until she was 14, at which time her mother came and took her away, and they moved to Firefly Lane. This is where she met Kate. Kate grew up with a loving family, two parents, a brother, a horse, and a big home. She had many opportunities. Tully and Kate did not become best friends right away, but they bonded over a traumatic event that happened to Tully. The event connected them together, and the two became inseparable. Tully was welcomed into Kate's home, and it truly was the one place where Tully felt accepted, loved, and safe. Tully and Kate are opposites. Kate is shy and quiet, and Tully is outgoing and confident. The two are opposites, but I think this is why the relationship works. They complement each other. I don't want to give too many details of the book away and spoil the story, but this book is about the hardships of growing up and the triumphs the two face together and how the events of the book shape them both. Tully grows up to become a famous news anchor who eventually hosts her own talk show, and Kate ends up supporting her best friend with her passion as a writer and producer. Kate is often portrayed as taking a back seat to her more dynamic and fiery best friend. Kate was often in Tully's shadow. However, even with some rough times with relationships, 
both women fiercely loved each other and were always there for each other. The story of friendship is heartwarming. Kate and Tully meet each other when they are 14 years old, and we get to see them grow old together, with Tully having a successful career and Kate having her own family and children. This is when the story takes a turn. The first book ends in a sad but comforting way, but I can't tell you more as I don't want to ruin it for you. In the sequel, Fly Away, the story continues, but it also follows the other people in Tully and Kate's lives, and it gives the reader a whole new, deeper understanding of the characters, their relationships, and how that played into their roles and their friendship. I really liked learning about the other characters' sides of the story because I felt like I was filling in blanks. You know, you just got the whole story and you understood everything so much better. It just added to the story. I really enjoyed Kristen Hanna's writing and I could not put the book down. My favorite thing about the author is how she describes her characters. After reading these books, I felt like I personally knew the characters and had a good understanding of their motivations. Honestly, I felt like I was friends with these people that I had never met because they were fictional characters. But I would recommend this book to anyone 12 years and up because no matter what age you are, I, I seriously think you will like this book. This book was also made into a Netflix TV series. But the book is much better, and I recommend reading the book first. The storyline of the Netflix series is a bit different from the storyline of the book, but both the book and the TV series capture the dynamic relationship between these two best friends. I think my favorite thing about Telly and Kate is that they were always there for each other. They could be going through a massive fight, and they wouldn't be speaking for big amounts of time but they were always best friends and they always loved each other when you would think they didn't so in conclusion i recommend this book it's branlin and Catherine, the branlin and Catherine show Buongiorno, it's Bran. And I'm Catherine. Today we're going to be talking about Robert Munch and some other honorable mentions. Woohoo! Woohoo! Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, do you remember in elementary school when our teachers would sit us down and read a book to us for like 30 minutes because there was no other way to get us all to calm down? Absolutely. Absolutely. Usually it was a Robert Munch book because that's what she that's what they knew would sell yeah. us to being quiet. Quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Munch was the author of a lot of our childhoods with really iconic books that we still remember to this day so get ready to feel some nostalgia this episode yeah it's nostalgia um yeah so there's one of the books uh we're going to be talking about is the saddest one out of all of his books and the most emotional one love you forever yeah Nothing you want to start Sure. I remember every time my teacher would read this, like people would end up being really, really sad or crying or stuff like that. Cause we were like seven, right? Yeah. Or eight. Yeah. Usually it wasn't usually those books that we got read that book that we got read to by teachers. Uh it was for me, it was mostly my dad doing it. And every time without a doubt he'd start crying because you know a very emotional book yeah do you want to quickly summarize it in case our audience has forgotten they, what it's about uh this could be a little fuzzy but uh love you forever is about this baby 
toddler like a baby and it's like the baby like the baby is growing up and like becomes a toddler and the mom and i think it's the mom that's like telling him to like not grow up because she does she wants him to stay little i think i'm like 90 percent sure um yeah and then it ends up that he grows up and the, the really sad part is that his mom is like old and she he's an adult he it's kind of shows the the third generation yeah. and at the very end that was always the saddest part yeah. for everyone yeah um an iconic one though is paper bag princess and i can remember one of my teachers dressing up as the paper bag princess for this like thing we did for less literacy week or or uh or i don't remember what day but it was a revol revolving around books at my school we used to uh, dress up like black characters and uh, one of my my grade three teacher uh, dressed up as the paper bag princess and it was really cool because it was like oh like it was a character that we learned by like her reading it to us mm -hmm. and then yeah mm -hmm. and it just that book is so interesting and it's like one of his first ones if not first and it's like Pretty good. It it started the mark for the books to come. I my favorite part especially is at the end when she emerges and all her from what I remember, all her clothes were burnt off, so she had to wear a paper bag. Yeah. And then when the prince finally came and saw her in a paper bag and covered in ashes and whatever, he's like, I can't marry you because you look terrible with all the ashes and the paper bag and everything. And she's like, you know what? If you think I look ugly because of that. I can do better than you and decides that she doesn't really need him in the end. And I've always liked that. Paper Bay Princess, the princess in Paper Bay Princess is a girl boss. Iconic. Mm -hmm. Doesn't need no man. And if a man doesn't like her, she doesn't exactly. care. She's not tied down. Yeah. She was doing better with the with the dragon there. Yeah. Just chilling with the dragon. So uh one book that I can remember quite well was Show and Tell, where uh, the main character, Ben, is trying to find something for Show and Tell that's, like, equally as cool. And, uh, yeah, I remember that one because at the time that, like, my school librarian read it to us, we had a class in, the, in or we had a classmate, in, or there was a classmate in my class who had uh, the name, like, his name was Ben. And we were all like, you know, when like a book mentions a name and it's sort of like, like, whoa, like that moment when yeah. you're at Will. Yeah. Uh, it's a, uh, that happened and everyone's like, oh my God, Ben, you're in the Robert Munch book. And like, he had like the most, like, like most popularity for like that few minutes when his name was mentioned. And that's like one of the core memories. There's always a little bit of excitement when you get your name in a book, especially if you have like an uncommon name, like to see your name in a book is very like, wow, someone knows my name actually exists kind of thing. I read Pride and Prejudice some time ago and there's a Lady Catherine who wants uh, her daughter to marry Mr. Darcy, but of course Mr. Darcy feels nothing for her and loves Lizzie. Um, and she's very like, she gives me a lot of Karen vibes. She's very like entitled and stuck up. It's like, you don't matter. My daughter is going to marry Mr. Darcy. And at first it was like, it was cool to see my name in a book, but at the same time, it's like, this character sucks. Yeah. Um, so the whole name thing ties into the next book we might be, I think we'll be talking about is Geronimo Stilton because at the front there's always like a little map with like numbers and names of like all the mice working in the Gazette and lo and behold I think your name's also in it I'm not sure but I'm pretty sure but 
brand one comes up in it, like spelled the exact same way. And she looks vaguely like me, like the character, like when I found her. And it's I, for I forgot about that map. I remember there was the map with the locations, but I forgot about the mice. Yeah, there was like, it was mostly in the older ones, like the beginning, it was usually that's where the mice were. And then as it got like, they became more and more popular. Yeah. The, um, the, it became like the map of like all the locations and stuff, which John of Silton is pretty good. Like I liked all of them. My favorites were the, um, like there was like a goth or like a vampire mouse. I don't remember her name, but she was really cool. And I read all of her like sub series, like the, uh, like, it was attached to John with Stilton. Like, like a spin-off series, kind of. Yeah, spin-off series. And it only lasts a couple of, like, books. But yeah, I remember like that five one. Five or six. Yeah. And then, let's just take a moment to talk about Thea. Because Thea was iconic. She had all these, like, I, I loved how they had, like, the girls had, like, were, like, more about, like, friendship and stuff. And, like, were, like, trying to think, well... Geronimo was sort of, like, nervous and, like, I found to him, it out. Yeah, I found him to be very, like, almost whiny in everything that he did. And he just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. But Thea was my childhood. She and all her Thea sisters are girl bosses. And Absolutely. they low-key made me into who I am today. I love them. Like, growing up with, like, uh, my friend group, like, back in elementary, um, we used to read them all together like we'd read different ones and then like we'd talk about it and it'd be like sort of a book club but not like to the like all the same book but like the same series and we used to like compare each other or compare ourselves to the Thea sisters and I got uh oh, I forgot her name the one from Tanzania uh but because like I was more of the mediator or like I was like trying to help my friends like not hate, not hate each other. So yeah. Yeah. I so there were five of them, right? There was Nikki, who was Australian. There was uh, oh, Violet, who was was she Chinese or Japanese? I don't remember. Chinese. Chinese. And then there was Paulina, who was from Peru. Yeah. Then there was Colette from France. And then... And I think Pamela was from Tanzania. Yeah. I also love the diversity in those characters. Absolutely. They were such a diverse, like, diverse group. Like, they were all from different, like, countries on different, like, which is super cool. And, like, um... Like, just them being diverse and, like, them being, like, the only, like, or one of the few only diverse, like, girl groups back then, like, it's so incredible to just, like, look back at that and, like, be like, oh, there was a bunch of diverse, like, go back and realize, oh, there's a bunch of diversity here. Yeah. Uh, my favorite, uh, my favorite book that I can remember from Thea Stilton, I read it probably, like, two or three times was when they went to India because the uh, king's son's like jewel had been stolen. And I love that book so much. I'm probably, Thea Sultan was probably the first fandom I was officially in, come to think of it. Um, I made like Rainbow Loom versions of the characters and like they were my invisible friends. Like I was obsessed as a kid. That's so cool. Uh, yeah, like my personal favorite book was or of the Thea Sultan series was either when they went to France or I think they went to France or when they went to Japan for the cherry blossom and there's like cherry blossoms on the cover. I That's really like those two ones. I, and those are like the ones that like stick out most because I remember I, I think I still have some, and those are the two that I 
cat. Mm -hmm. I remember having, I remember looking at the back of the book to see all the other ones there were and be like, oh, I want to read that one. No, I want to read that one. Yeah. Eight-year-old me never got to actually read all the ones I wanted to, so I might go back to that later. Yeah, I think I might too. And then I I recently went into like a bookstore and wanted to see if they still sold them, but now they're like hardcovers, which is like... Like, they're a whole different series, but they still have, like, the and Geronimo's names on them, but it's, like, completely different. And it's, like, so sad, because I remember picking up, like, from the library, all those little books, like, about five of them, because I could get through them so well, because they were bigger print. Mm-hmm. So, me being, having glasses, I was able to read them, like, while in bed, so, instead of, like instead of having to put my glasses on to read them, which was pretty awesome. And speaking of series, another honorable mention is Rainbow Magic. Um, so that one, that series, for those of you that might not remember or haven't read it before, is about two girls named Ra- Rachel and Kirsty, and they can see fairies like no one else can, and they have like a special... Uh, friendship with the fairies and they have to help uh, their fairy friends find a specific magic object for every book so there were like little sub series kind of the entire series was called rainbow magic but then you would have like seven books that were like the color fairies or the sports fairies or stuff like that Um, Uh, yeah yeah um uh, there was an instrument series, and I can remember this book because uh, in grade two, like, my teacher was switching stools, so she gave us all, like, a book each, and uh, so I got a Rainbow Magic book, and it was Danny the Drum Fairy, and I thought that was so cool, like, because, like, I I saw, like, growing up with music and stuff, I saw a lot of, like, guy drummers, not so much girl drummers and seeing like a girl fairy being a drummer as well that's super cool I think a really interesting thing that I've noticed among all these different um like series for girls they have a lot of like diversity and powerful characters that you even don't see in modern day fiction yeah Yeah. like you have the the Thea sisters who are like girl bosses and going all over the world solving mysteries and stuff and then you have like fairies doing all kinds of things like soccer volleyball playing the drums like I'm pretty sure there was like one boy in that entire series and he was the king but that's about it and they were all like amazing yeah like it's just so cool like especially with like uh with like the rainbow magic like just like seeing and they were also diverse like they were there they were like they weren't all just like blonde fairies they had like like they were like they had different races and like different like hair textures which is super cool because not a lot of people get that not a lot of people have like that sort of representation which i don't know i think it's so cool how like most of like the girl like when people like guys like guys growing up would be like like oh you don't have this series like you don't have any representation in this series but the series is great we can be like well we have all sorts of representation with the series that are catered to that are meant for us and it's just like yeah yeah and it's interesting Because it's targeted to a younger demographic. And when they talk about putting more diversity in things, uh, like a lot more adult shows are putting more diversity in them. But the kids' uh, books have had them all along. Yeah. If you think about it. And I remember having Saffron the Yellow Fairy, and I. I love that name. It's so cool. Afron like, is a beautiful name. I think it's and, a spice. Yeah. And it's like, 
one of the like i think it's one of the most expensive spices so you know that's really <laughs> rad um and then i don't enjoy what they did with the name for this one but i liked this one too it was inky the indigo fairy like mm. all the different like colors and stuff they were so cool yeah uh, i remember my favorite series out of that one being the the jewel fairies so you had uh the ruby fairy emerald fairy topaz sapphire diamond amethyst i don't remember but there were seven different jewels and i remember that one was my favorite because the jewels each had they were a little bit like infinity stones they had different powers that did different things for example i remember one uh changed the reality of things um uh i don't remember what the others did but i remember that one being my favorite um i also just looked up some of the, the like the newer ones are so diverse like there's like dina the diwali fairy and like That's so cool alicia the eid or eyed fairy that is cool and then like just that's so cool how there's like like instead of just having like the stereotypical oh here's like noel the i think her name's noel but the christmas fairy they like, did have that yeah yeah but like instead of, it's like being more diverse with like celebrate celebrations and such which that is really cool i did not know that and then there's like different jobs where there's like the librarian fairy and cool. the nurse fairy and the engineer fairy which the engineer I, fairy that's incredible the engineer fairy is also in a wheelchair so there's also disability representation that's incredible we love, we love daisy meadows we love her we love to Amazing. see them I should buy the jewel fairies just for nostalgia's sake and then see how many more diverse fairies I can get and just fill my bookshelf with them. I would hand, I'm, I'm planning uh, uh, with the money I receive from something like job related um, that uh, I'm gonna go out and buy like all the cool ones and then like keep those in a box and if I ever like decide to have kids those i'm gonna show them that like yeah i think there are also two types of children's books you have like the young children's chapter books and then you have the like picture books and while the picture books are fairly like you know simple and for like four or five six year olds to understand the like the little kids chapter books are better than some of the books I've read at 15. It, yeah, like, like, looking back, like, I used to complain about reading all the time, like, as a little kid being like, oh, I want to go outside or whatever. But like, like, now I want to take back when I say that I didn't want to read like those books, because like, honestly, I've read some really big misses for books and I just wasted so much time on those books when I could have could have been you know reading the like the rainbow magic books yeah remember the scholastic book fair or the scholastic book orders that would come every month in elementary school and like scrolling through them and wanting to buy them and your parents are like eh maybe I only received a scholastic order once and it wasn't even for me it was for christmas presents for my younger cousins i think no i think i got a couple of books from that but like i remember the scholastic fair and how problematic it was because like like less for like the less like fortunate kids like the with like parents with lower income would like see their like peers who have like who bring like a bunch of money for the, like this fair thing and then like be sort of left out like I don't mm -hmm. I, I don't know that the fair the book orders 
are like okay but when it got to the point where like books were so expensive and such like at the fair it's really your average cool. yeah your average book right now is probably like 30 dollars when it used to be like 15 right yeah like uh inflation and then you get the people who don't like reading just come to get the like long bendy erasers or the pretty looking bookmarks that no one's ever going to use or the posters I have posters that have been in my house for a couple of years now. Um, and I got my first Hunger Games book from a book fair and stuff like that. But then you have people who like just buy the small, cool plastic stuff and forget about it. Like, that's not the point of a book fair. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah, like book book fair shouldn't like should include some like reading like thing like accessories like bookmarks because some kids do use them but like when it's literally like oh here's this gigantic eraser that says big mistake on it like that and now like with like certain like that like that thing being like thrown around like a joke like what it's sort of like oh Okay, this sort of this this sort of eraser is trying to enable bullying down the line, mm-hmm. and like it's just like, like they should have uh, they should have made the like the posters and the merch have something to do with the books, because yeah. I remember what was all the rage when I was at the age when there were Scholastic book fairs were those animal erasers that you would pick apart and then put them back together. Um, and like, it would be cool if you could have like a Hedwig one from Harry Potter or a Pegasus one or like Medusa or something cool from like literature or mythology or anything that has to do with books. Or like, if you have a poster for like fan art of characters from things or, uh, like all the different book covers on one poster for popular series like that would have been more interesting than just like oh here's a shiny car and also it's a book fair right yeah it's like uh like just like i don't know and then like but like then like but like the but then instead of like having like literature based things it'd be the posters that say like the cloud, like, I'm on cloud nine, and it'd be all cloudy, and it'd be, like, it was, like, really, like, probably cool for young kids, but Mm -hmm. not, like, it's, like, incredibly tacky. Because, also, you have to give them that. The book fair was for elementary school kids. Yeah. We definitely have a different perspective on it, because I haven't been in elementary school for three years and I don't know how long it's been for you but six oh yeah but then oh I feel but it was all the rage in elementary school even though now it's kind of problematic to think about yeah uh yeah I'm like I look back and I'm like it feel like as me being like in my last year of high school seeing that like uh seeing like talking about this and like seeing like elementary school kids like pick up books that I also read it's like oh I've only read like I read this like four years ago or like or like like two years ago thinking like it's much like like such straight was like six years ago so I'm like thinking that it was way closer like the concept is of time is so weird yeah yeah oh beer and saying bears oh yeah i remember those yeah i wasn't so much of a like reader of the books but i remember watching the show a lot yeah, I had a couple of the books in my house, and I remember, again, looking at the, the back, being like, oh, what, what else ones do they have? Um, 
I remember looking at the the no girls allowed one and being very like, hey, that's not fair. Yeah. Like, it's so funny, like, as kids, like, if there was, like, a big, like, no girls allowed thing, we'd, like, take it seriously because, Mm -hmm. like, we thought it was serious. But then, like, and then, but, like, now we know, like, oh, they're just, like, it's not actually just for, like, no girls allowed. Like, girls can do whatever they, yeah. they want. But, like, uh, but, yeah, it's all right. And this is sort of off topic and not on, like, what we were saying. But Fancy Bears gets me thinking about Franklin, like, the turtle. Franklin the turtle. And that was that was an interesting series. I loved Franklin books. Like, there was not a day, like, when I was, like, four or five or six where I wouldn't read a uh, Franklin. Like, I think I had the whole collection of the books. And then, like, on top of that, I also watched the show. And it wasn't even that good, but, like, it was such, like, I just, it was so fun. Yeah. I think one thing that the Franklin and the Berenstain Bears, they did, they had a lot of like moral of the story kind of thing at the end of them. Yeah. It was like Berenstain Bears are manners. And there was one about like responsibility and then honesty and, and being like inclusive or whatever there was. Um, yeah. And I think it definitely, it either helped or didn't. I don't know yet. Yeah. Uh it's so like it's just so interesting to look back on these memories and like these books that we've read and like talk about them because it like brings back like nostalgia and like nostalgia is great but and it, like sometimes it gets you sad but sometimes it gives happy moments you know mm-hmm. yeah nostalgia is kind of like a mix of sad and happy while thinking about the past because it's like on one hand the past is over and it's not coming back and on the other hand it's like hey this happened that was cool yeah well thanks for tuning in i'm branman and i'm Catherine. signing off toodles bye stay tuned for next month's